Hello and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts about all things finance. If you get value out of this episode, please subscribe so you don't miss out on any in the future. I hope you enjoy. Charlie, so thank you so much for joining the podcast to talk about your recently released book, the Company Valuation Playbook, Invest With Confidence. Um, so I just wanted to start off by asking what was your motivation for writing the book? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, I've wanted to write a book for quite some time and this was a topic that actually really frustrated me early in my career. I mean, like genuinely annoyed me because there, there's plenty of financial exams and content out there, uh, but very often they're not particularly practical. If you take the CFA, for example, Chartered Financial Analyst exam, which most people that go into finance will, will try and take at least, um, and I, you, you will have to put hundreds of hours into studying. And yet at the end of it, you don't know how to create a fi financial model. Um, I find it, found it absolutely remarkable and very frustrating. So, so this, this book, The Company Valuation Playbook, is by my own little attempt uh, to try and ease the way in um, for those early in their career who just want to kind of get an accelerated um, blast of, of how you go valuing a company, that the tools and techniques that are, are used throughout the industry globally. Yeah, definitely. And hopefully it's a little bit less than the 100 hours <laughs> you did for the CFA. <laughs> hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? So you, you start off by mentioning sort of in the book the, the core cast and the mode approach to investing. Uh, can you elaborate on this technique a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I, so this is this is a technique actually I, I made. And I, and, and I made it because I realised consultants, um, every other kind of field you've got, a fairly good structure and mythology for looking at things that you can consistently apply and fund management in a, in a way misses out that. Um, so I've pinched, I mean, I've pinched a few things for, from, from others on, on this, um, but the general idea is that you want to find a business with an attractive court. Um, so that means that management, find management that are capable, accountable and, and well aligned. And those two, are, are, those two last ones, accountable and capable, well aligned are almost as important as capable um, when considering management and making sure that you've got management that really are vested in um, creating shareholder shareholder value. Uh, the second one is the the castle and that's kind of finding businesses uh, kind of that have a good future um, that you can expect to thrive in the future, um, ha have attractive um, returns on on investment etc and I, I kind of fleshed that out a bit in that section and then the last one that moat I, I pinched this from from Warren Buffett of course he, he loves to talk about economic moats um, but I thought, thought it was absolutely kind of a, a brilliant analogy because um, there's plenty of businesses with good management and kind of very profitable and, and yet if they're kind of trading businesses and there's no reason that you can be confident that will carry on into the future um, that business is not going to have a very high value. So it is a kind of critical part, and I, and I kind of detail out the different types of moats that you can have. So for example, um, the network effects that you might get uh, from, from Google, for instance, um, the kind of scale advantages that they have every time you, every time you use Google, um, they're improving their algorithm, and that's improving the user experience. And, and subsequently, you're likely to, to use it more. Yeah, definitely. And I, I found that inter very interesting, like putting it all together. And um, that was sort of the, you mentioned the qualitative um, sort of analysis of, of the company. Um, another thing as well is oftentimes the problem is not sort of the availability of information, but sifting through the noise. So there's so much information now, it's just sort of understanding what's really relevant. Um, what tactics do you really use to, to do that, to, to know what information is relevant when valuing a company? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And because I go on forums like Quora and I see some of the answers, kind of how do you value an IPO? And people say, well, just look through the prospectus. And I mean, a prospectus can be hundreds of pages long. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I think the areas to prioritize in terms of the, the quantitative act aspect um, are, are looking through the actual audited numbers of the company. Um, most investors in most industries I'd suggest the simplest one to look at is the, the income statement. That's a pretty good um, snapshot of how the company has operated in, in, in recent history. You can actually kind of find what I find very, very helpful. If you go to the investor relations part of a company's website, um, you can also download the presentation. Uh, those are brilliant ways of kind of just also 
quite often they'll put some images in there they'll put kind of bar charts to show you how it's changed over time you have to be very aware that the company is going to frame the information in a way that makes them look good or or more importantly ma look, makes management look effective so kind of it's worth being somewhat cynical in the back of your mind but at the same time th those are kind of brilliant means of just getting a very quick idea of of what a company's achieved and what you can expect going forward yeah, definitely. And they're sort of like sales pitches, aren't they? So it's trying to look look past the salesy part and what they're trying to sell you and that, at the actual numbers. Yes, yeah. You know, um, and now there's also some great websites, Google Finance, Yahoo Finance. But some of these websites, there's sometimes errors, obviously, but they've done a great job at aggregating uh, lots of information on companies into kind of a, 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 single, a single page. Yeah, definitely. I think these days there's less of a divide between so the access that the retail traders have to the institutions, aren't there? A lot of the information, while there are still benefits of institutions, obviously a lot of the information is available for everyone. Yeah, you, you know what though? I mean, people say that's a, a they've got a huge informational edge. Um, but I mean, I, I, I used to be a fund manager myself. I, I managed the London listed Jupiter Emerging and Frontier um, Income Trust, uh, which, is, which is still trading. And the problem you find there is that you have so much information that it's very easy to miss the wood from the trees and I sometimes think retail investors that are able to step back um, kind of sometimes there's a lot there's a lot to be said for for taking that type of a, approach I think many active institutional investors are, are less fundamental investors and and more just informational traders it's just mm -hmm. about getting an edge on this quarter's results you think you know something which others don't and and, and that's just very spec is it's speculation far less than kind of proper investing so one thing you mentioned there is sort of the valuation of companies and a key focus of the um company valuation sort of mentioned in the book is the intrinsic valuation and relative valuation uh so can you can you explain these for our listeners and sort of how each of them can be used i think you mentioned a little bit before there yeah sure so yeah so as you say kind of and and this is globally this isn't just a, a me thing or a uk uk <laughs> it, 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 these are the tools that are globally used um, the first one is relative valuation and the philosophy there is that basically similar assets with similar risk and return profiles should trade at similar valuations. And this is like if you're looking for, for a new house, you, you'd look at what other houses had sold at along the street to get a sense of roughly how much you, you should be paying. Um, of course, when it comes to companies, you'll get companies of varying sizes. And so what we do is we standardize that using a multiple um, that's a bit like when you're looking for a house, if you were to say um, you're paying whatever, $300 per, per square feet. In the same way we do that for a company, you, you would say, for instance, you're paying nine times the company's earnings. And that's, that's a measure that you can easily standardize any company of any size and make them relatively comparable. Um, so that's relative evaluation. The intrinsic valuation is more kind of academically satisfying, but there's no doubt that it does take longer um, to produce. And intrinsic valuation is based on the premise that a company is worth the returns that it will generate in the future. Mm. So if you owed me uh, $100 in a year's time, I'd say roughly the value of that obligation was $100. And that, that, that makes sense. Of course, though, within that, you've got to adjust that $100 the risk that you won't pay me or the kind of risk of high inflation um, during that time and, and that's the part of it which which gets a bit more technical i go through that step by step in the book and hopefully make that kind of clear um, but there's no doubt if you want to if you're a retail investor you're an individual just want to get going and investing relative valuation is the easier one and lots of these websites google finance yahoo finance they make it very easy they already do the the, ca the multiple calculations for you for price to earnings, price to sales, dividend yield, etc. Yeah, definitely. I think the intrinsic valuation you talk about sort of the um, DCF, so the discounted cash flow uh, model, and, and how sort of valuable that is to actually see, um, you know, the, as you the cash flow and sort of what it's actually worth today. You know, the, the future cash flow is that a major tool you'd say? Yeah, and, and I I always prefer that one because it's good to have that discipline. What what it makes you do is think further into the future. Um, I, I always say don't invest in a company um, for even two minutes if you wouldn't be happy investing in it for 20 years. I, th I think Warren Buffett actually put it better than this. 
I forget the exact phrase, but it was something like when he invests, he thinks about if the exchange was to close down for the, for the next 10 years after, would he be comfortable um, still hold it, kind of holding that stock? And it's, it's a good way to think about it. And intrinsic valuation makes you think of the company uh, company's valuation in terms of its its whole life, whereas relative valuation is, is typically based on the earnings that year or your projected one year earnings. Uh, and that means that there's often a, a lot more of a short termist mentality than you perhaps getting intrinsic valuation. So you, the, another part that you mentioned is sort of the special valuation situations and investors should be aware of. So you mentioned, uh, mentioned M&A, M mergers and acquisitions, leverage buyouts, startups and banks. So how do these situations sort of change investors sentiment and what they should watch out for? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the basics of relative and intrinsic valuation, they are applicable to any company in any industry, um, any geography, whether it's listed on a stock exchange or privately held. Um, but it's worth being aware that certain types of transactions can kind of change the, some of the economics behind, behind that. So for instance, when a merger or acquisition happens, um, the company buying the, the target company uh, will typically try and realize um, synergies um, Often it's the case, especially if it's strategic investor, uh, there may be opportunities to, to cut a headquarter headcount because of, you don't need to double up on a lot of, a lot of those roles. And um, there's perhaps kind of branding, branding synergies. I, I, I list quite a, quite a few. And it's just incorporating those synergies um, into, your, into your forecast so that you've got a bit more of an accurate kind of disc, um, valuation output at the end of it. Yeah, definitely. And just being aware of the possibility. I think we've seen it um, recently with the Morrison buyout and sort of just being aware of these things and how they could affect the actual valuation of the company, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, certainly. And like, always being aware that like one, one add one doesn't equal two. <laughs> um, it, it's well worth you. When companies merge or, or one acquires the other, it's not just slamming the kind of financials of the two together. There is a bit of nuance to it in terms of how, how you how you consider the impact. Yeah, definitely. Um, and sort of one of the main reasons people miss out on profits is due to behavioral biases or mistakes, which is sort of another chapter in the book. Uh, so can you expand on this and suggest sort of how investors can avoid these mistakes that are so easy to make? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I thought this, for me, this was one of the more interesting ones to write. And I know that I have been a victim again and again and again <laughs> of this. I, I think anybody who invests will likely be a victim of this at some point. I think, what, again, sorry to keep quoting Warren Buffett at you, but I, I think he said something along the lines of anybody with an IQ, kind of, it, it's pretty much the same once you've got an IQ above 25. You do not need to be tremendously smart to be an investor. Um, but what it is about is it's about controlling your passions, controlling your urges, because we, 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 all, we all have them. And I, and I go through some of those behavioral biases that are, are very evident um, across any investor in the book. And, and just the means of controlling them, I, I'd say try and be very methodic about how you go valuing a company. And this is one of the reasons why I did the court Carson Moat approach, because that's something that people can apply to any company. And also, if, you, if you've got others with you, um, try and play a bit of devil's advocate. Think about if you're buying something, remember that somebody's going to be selling that and they've probably got a reason for selling that. So try and understand why they're selling it. And because it's very easy to, you're looking at a company, you love the brand, you think that it's got great people and it's very easy to um, put your biases then into the valuation and kind of perhaps make the, the numbers um, yeah, not what they would objectively otherwise eyes be. Um, so having somebody come at it with a fresh pair of eyes, ideally, um, to, to give in the, some independent thoughts on on why why you shouldn't hold it, um, that that can be tremendously powerful. Yeah, and I think it's something you mentioned in the book where oftentimes you see you know the first piece of information you see is the thing that you sort of stick to, whereas yeah. it's digging deeper or you know as you say getting that different opinion. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so true. And and again, I'm, I mean, again, again, in all these examples, I also kind of plenty of of these biases we have in our own lives as well. First impressions, if you if you are calling that in in your life, kind of, so what, what's the person wearing, etc. That can that will subsequently explain a lot of what you 
your your subsequent impression may, may be. Um, one that I know that I, I often get particularly caught up in is the is anchoring. Um, is is when you so in a, in evaluation context, if you buy a the stock at ten and it goes to twelve, you think great, maybe it's kind of, but now it's perhaps so overvalued. Whereas just because you brought it at 10 and that is where your anchor is, that does not mean that was kind of neutral value at the time. Yeah. You should think of a company, you should think of your stock in the share. Um, would I be holding this? Would I be buying this if I, if I purchased it today? Um, so just thinking objectively and independently. Yeah, definitely. And that's the same thing. Whereas if, uh if a stock's gone down in price and you're like, oh, okay, it's gone down this much, it can't go down any further. It's looking at as the same thing, the valuation of the company rather than just the, sort of the price action. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's so hard to hold your nerve when stocks go down. It is, it is not a nice feeling. Um, markets go up over time, but, but we certainly know that things can get very hairy. Um, and, and it's very, very easy. And especially when you look at the media, um, but often it is the best time to, to then be buying stocks because you are at valuations um, with quite often tremendous upside. Yeah, definitely. So we'll go on to your career because it's actually been quite interesting. So you, you studied in Beijing, so sort of for university, and then you worked at, you mentioned before, Jupiter Investment Fund, uh, focusing on emerging markets. So can I ask, because you studied in Beijing, did you focus specifically on China? Uh, and can you explain how emerging markets sort of are different to developed markets? Yeah, sure. So, so yeah, I studied in Beijing. Um, I did an economics and trade in Chinese. Um, my wife's Chinese, actually, so <laughs> I, I, st I still try to keep it up. And it was there that I, I got interested in emerging markets because markets like that, at least compared to the UK, um, so dynamic. So many of the individuals there very, very entrepreneurial. Um, I think you often think about Chinese and communist, uh, but I think kind of as China's been moving in the opposite direction throughout much of that time um, you you've got some very 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 driven people and actually you're, you're starting to see you've got some worldwide compet globally competitive companies uh, there China is no longer just the manufacturing base for for western goods uh, they themselves kind of there's a huge consumption appetite uh, Nike Apple all of these companies try, trying and trying to, to get into China and, and emerging markets, I mean, emerging market, the easy way to explain it is just the opposite of developed markets. It's just nations um, that, that are more early stage in their development. Um, so typically that's classified as like lower per capita income, for example, uh, less developed fin financial markets. And typically those markets are higher risk. You've got more geopolitical risk, you've got more currency risk, et cetera, uh, but you've got some phenomenal kind of structural drivers in many of those markets. So for example, greater financial inclusion, um, healthcare penetration, infrastructure de development, and many of those kind of structural drivers that you don't really get in developed markets to, to that extent. Yeah, definitely. And I found it, I talked to someone who was sort of a, um, a fund manager in Vietnam, and he was saying that I think that the Vietnamese uh, sort of stock exchange has only been open for about 20 years. And, you know, you compare that to the UK, which is, you know, hundreds of years. It, it just sort of shows you why they are developing countries. Like they just don't have that history of sort of, of, of trading of an, and of these publicly traded companies. Yeah. For, I, I went to Vietnam actually kind of about four, four years ago. I mean, really remarkable, fast moving place. And again, it's, it's another country that's kind of come out of communism and you had a lot of, I, I met plenty of people who are working for state companies um, but these were people that wanted these companies to privatize and get listed. And, and just that, that transfer going from state to private, I, th I think is so powerful. It's so exciting for the people that work there as well. You could really feel the energy in that country. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so on to my next question, while I'm not asking for financial advice, um, what would you see as the greatest opportunities and risks sort of in emerging market, uh, markets over the next sort of five years? Um, I think so. So emerging markets at the moment, if you're an investor, um, the markets that dominate emerging markets are China, Russia, um, India, to a, to a, to a certain extent, and, and arguably kind of Korea, Taiwan, although those are more developed markets. The, the, problem, the problem with emerging markets is that it's very hard to, to make one, um, one statement about their prospects, but they are so different. So for example, a high oil price will, will benefit Russia 
um, but it will be a disadvantage for, for India. Uh, what's happening in China bears very little relation really to what's happening in Brazil or Mexico or Romania. Um, so, so they're very difficult, different markets. And I think that's one of the reasons why they are so attractive for investors, because although independently any one of those countries is gonna be very high risk, collectively, because the risks are very different, um, the correlation of those risks is, is low, and therefore the overall volatility um, is not nearly as high as you would expect. It is higher than developed markets, but it's not nearly as, as high as you would otherwise think when you when you look at the news and hear what's happening with Russia, for, for, for example. And But I, I think kind of largely some, some of those structural changes, which I, I, I spoke of, financial inclusion, et cetera, um, they, those are pretty much consistent throughout mo most most emerging markets. Um, I think the one generalism that you can perhaps give in terms of risk is, and that emerging market investors typically fear um, is a strong dollar or, or to flip that another way, currency risk for emerging markets. Uh, they are typically more fragile than developed markets and currencies can move against you far faster um, during periods of crisis. Yeah, definitely. I think inf and inflation in a lot of those countries as well. So say Vietnam is, is OK now, but it's had issues in the past in South countries in South America. It's just making sure that those those actual sort of economies have control over that, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, for a lot of the Asian ones, it's, al it's always um, it's always difficult to say, say this, but I think kind of the Asian crisis that a lot of those economies went through, I, I think that has scarred many yeah. policy makers and that's not to say that if runaway inflation and currency issues won't happen again but i think a lot of those issues they have done quite a bit to put measures in place to make sure that never again that that extent of crises happen these are all kind of markets that will go through the cycles but i don't they've been very very persistent about making sure that another kind of collapse currency collapse does not happen yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, them going through COVID and not having that was a sort of good example of the stability yeah. of it. Um, so is there a, a sort of a, a country, say emerging or not, that you believe doesn't receive the attention that it, it should from international investors? Oh, that, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I, for me, some of the Eastern European countries, I think, are, are really great. And you can just, the, the, the valuations there are also brilliant because Eastern Europe, it's often looked by emerging market investors because they're not that large in terms, there's not that many companies listed, the liquidity is not great. So a lot of the large institutional investors just overlook those countries. Yeah. At the same time, a lot of the kind of European investors also, it's it's a more emerging than proper Europe. They've, it's not like France and Germany. And so they also overlook it. And as a result, you, you've got some really, in my view, interesting companies and you've got quite often very good management in some of those markets as, as well, very kind of, willing also to pay a dividend so a lot of these companies you've got income a reasonable level of dividend yield and the prospect of income growth to come yeah definitely i think a lot of those countries as well are sort of going through similar they're probably a bit bit ahead of some countries in asia where you know turning to service economies and sort of a lot of their a lot of the people in the economy are actually looking to you know consume more and spend more and i, I think that's when i talked to the per, uh, to the fund manager from vietnam he says that's where he sees the real opportunity I think that's where we'll see the growth, isn't it? The money spent on consumption and and services in, in those specific countries. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kind of, yeah, growing disposable income and like broad, broadening middle class it, for most emerging market investors. That that will be a huge theme. Um, and and you can, I mean, even in China, if you just look at China the last decade, it's quite remarkable um, the mindset change and now the spending power. Yeah. Of, of many Chinese, especially when you look across the co the coastal cities. Of course, when you look at China in aggregate and look at per capita income and everything, it, it's still very low down. But in some of these cities, there's, there's now amazing, <laughs> there's now a lot of wealth. You look at Shanghai, you look at Guang, Guangdong, um, pl plenty of wealth there, lots of kind of high high end stores trying to take advantage of that. Yeah, that's the thing. And, you know, it might be a lower percentage, but it's still, you know, if it's 10%, it's still 130 million people. So it's a, it, it's a lot in aggregate. Um, so do you see the anti, so we've seen quite a few antitrust issues, uh, especially in China over the past sort of months and years. And uh, we've seen Ant Group and recently Diddy. Uh, do you sort of see this continuing uh, and maybe there'll be a continued uncertainty in Chinese tech investing? Yeah, absolutely. That 
so especially in tech investing uh, and arguably especially in China, um, it policy making does make a big difference. And even if it's not directly policy making, if the state wants to not go in a certain direction, somebody will be on the phone to the CEO of that company to tell them so. Um, so sometimes you, in a country like China, often you have to read between the lines. And there's a, there's a couple of website, media websites, financial work like Taishin, et cetera, where you know they're effectively the mouthpiece of the state and what policymakers want. So, so often it kind of bears far more fruit to like read through these um, articles from, from these uh, me media publications than perhaps it would otherwise be in the UK trying to, for instance, read through the Telegraph or something, because in, in China, it genuinely does have an impact on policy making. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I've, I think certainly for Chinese investors not to, um, not, not to overlook policy change, or, although for, for me that quite often, in my view at least, also creates opportunities. I mean, a lot of these issues, you can see prices come down 20, 30, 40%. And you think this is a company that you, you're buying, you're, you're paying that amount for the shares because it's gonna be around for decades to, to come. If they go and get a like whatever, 500 million fine in the greater scheme of things, <laughs> that's not, you know, that, that should shave a couple of percent off its, its market cap, not go and collapse, um, collapse its value. Yeah, I think we saw that with Alibaba, didn't we? Where it's, you know, compared to US companies, just such a, you know, there's such a different valuation, whereas, you know, the size of the company and the, the actual money they're making, it's just amazing. So you'd say that there's, that sort of gives opportunities when it, there might be the short term dip to, to potentially buy in and take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Alibaba is quite an interesting one because, of course, I think mean, Jack Ma has said <laughs> a couple of controversial statements. Um, but Jack Ma has, like for a couple of years now, he's been passing over the reins. He's been kind of step, step back in from the day to day. For, for kind of Westerners like us, of course, he's still very much the face of Alibaba, but kind of within Alibaba itself, and I know, I know some people at Alibaba, um, he's not in the day, day to day control. So of course it's bad when you have a figurehead like that, um, who's in the press for the wrong reasons. But, uh, but at the same time, on a 10 year view, is this going to collapse the case for investing in Alibaba? I, I don't think so. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, it's looking at a longer term, term view of investing. Um, so for myself, I've, I've recently started an internship as an equity analyst focusing sort of on emerging markets. Uh, so what advice would you give to myself and maybe others in a similar position that uh, you would have liked to hear when you started your own financial career? So at the, so at the start, and this was advice got, that got given to me, ask as many questions as you can. It's a, a brilliant opportunity to go back to basics. And I think, and I, I mentioned this in the book as well, of course, um, that just getting reacquainted, like even for people with a decade, two decades of experience, often kind of going back to basics and getting reacquainted with a company is really helpful. Because what, what you find, especially on the buy side, for those that are fund, um, that you are looking at a lot of companies and it's quite, quite easy to kind of get lost in the weeds as, as it was. So really making sure early in your career that you're, you're building up a base knowledge. You're not just kind of information trading, you're really understanding what drives these businesses because these are companies that you'll be kind of looking at, engaging with their management for, for, for decades, hopefully <laughs> to, to, to come. Um, so, so certainly kind of doing that groundwork now, I think it's absolutely well, well worth it. Yeah, awesome. So you'd say sort of getting, getting an understanding of the macroeconomic landscape and obviously also these industries and how, how they work would be a major thing to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool, awesome. Uh, so on to my last question. So thanks so much for joining us today, but I just wanted to ask, what is sort of the one message you'd like people to take away from your book? Um, and so I, one of the reasons I wrote my book is really because I want to promote fundamental investing. I, I do think... I do think it is so, so important. Um, it's not just a profitable means of going about and, and, and making money, but also the kind of the, the social benefits that it brings as well. And being able to engage and using your vote, using your vote to affect change at companies that you're invested in. Um, if you don't believe in fossil fuels, well, you can kind of reflect that in your, in, in your vote. Um, if, if they're doing certain projects, you can vote against management, et cetera. So, um, I think kind of the, the one thing I'd encourage people to do is 
is not go half-hearted into it. Uh, I, I often think kind of you are at your greatest potential for danger when you are very confident you know how to value a company but actually you've just kind of skimmed through a couple of websites and I, I think there's plenty of people that are at risk at that to kind of really try and educate yourself whether it's using this book or jumping onto some kind of financial course um, it is well worth doing it yeah and i think it's even more risk because now it's sort of fat and fashionable thing to do isn't it investing so it's yeah. more risk that people just jump into it and you know we're seeing with gamestop and everything <laughs> how that works but you'd say sort of do the work that extra time and you'll see the rewards yeah yeah All right awesome so charlie thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the book um if someone wants to get in contact with you or sort of uh, see, see more about what you do where would they go for that sure so i've got a website www.companyvaluationplaybook.com and you can met you can message me on there it's got a bit more detail about the book uh, it's available on amazon uh and, and it just kind of it's also got a bit of information on other books which i think are well worth reading for those early in their career and a few a few quotes as well which i think do well at capturing uh key investment philosophies Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I found the book uh, suggestions quite interesting. There's a few I haven't heard, so I'll have to <laughs> give them a read. So yeah. So as I said before, thank you so much for joining me today. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for having me on.